Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of the Pandemic Interview Series. Today I'm talking with a gentleman from Mexico by the name of Roberto Martinez. Loyal. Roberto is a HEMA practitioner. He's a teacher, he's an actor, he's a stuntman, and he runs an event in Mexico. Thanks a lot for joining us, Rob. I've been looking forward to talking to you. We've known each other a long time and uh, it's been amazing to watch both your progress in things that I'm involved in, but also all the other work that you've been doing. Yeah, I think we actually met way back in 2006, I believe. It's so been it's quite been, a while. It's you been a just while. A little one. You've done a lot of different things. Um, but what I'd like to know to start off with is, when did you start studying martial arts and what kind of martial arts did you start with? Okay, so I started out as a kid, as most people do, with karate back in 84, 84, 85, I think, back in Ithaca, New York. I, I was doing some karate. Then we moved back to Mexico City and I started doing Taekwondo. And so that was my basic martial arts training. I wasn't really thrilled with the way Taekwondo was going, especially when it went Olympic. So I kind of dropped it and was out of the martial arts scene for a long time. I started sword fighting in 2003. And you also run a group down there in Mexico City. What's the name of your group? Yes, I'm the lead instructor for the Elite Fencing Club in Mexico City. My fencing partner, he came up to me and said, well, why don't we start our own fencing club? And my response was, well, because I don't know enough to teach. And he told me, yeah, but you know a lot more than everyone else down here in Mexico. Yes, you probably know a lot less than a lot of other people in the U.S. and Europe, but you know a lot more than people down here. So just teach us what you know and keep learning. Okay, well, yeah, that makes sense. And that's how my, my group started. Okay. I'm a, I'm a trained stunt, uh, stunt professional with the United Stuntmen's Association. And I trained in 2001. So by, uh, by 2002, I get an email from Daniel Ford Beavis telling me about the Patty Crane workshop up in Canada. It's supposed to be a fencing or a stage fencing workshop. And me just being fresh out of stunt school, I said, well, sure, why not? So I went to the Patty Crane and it was a very wonderful experience because it wasn't just stage fighting or stage fencing. All this fencing had a historical background. I met wonderful people like Brad Waller, who is one of the most well-versed and educated people I know in terms of historical fencing and motion on the body. And that's the same workshop a few years later where you and I met. So when we're talking about the stunt work, you've done a lot of different types of stunt work, but one of the ones that I find very interesting is you also do a lot of work doubling the female leads. Yes. How does that work when you're trying to do all this stunt work, but you're in all, a completely different set of clothing? Well, first of all, it, I find it very fortunate that myself am able to stunt double for women because it just gives me more options to work as a stunt performer down here. I know this is very frowned upon in the U.S. and that Latinos should only stunt double for Latinos and women should only stunt double for women and there is no men stunt doubling for women and it's very frowned upon in the U.S. Not so much in Mexico. I do want to make that clear because a lot of people watching in the U.S. might feel offended that I'm stunt doubling for women. One of my best experiences was we were shooting a movie and I'm all dressed up. We actually never got to the scene. We, we were running late, so, the, so I got cut. 
but they had another stunt woman on set. So once I was all dressed up and the, the makeup and everything, and this is a stunt woman who had been working in the business for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. And I'm her competition. And not only am I a competition, I'm also a man. And she comes up and says, you know what, what you're doing, you're doing it well, keep doing it. Nice. So, so that pat on the back meant the world to me as a stunt performer. It meant, okay, I'm not stepping on anybody's toes because even though I'm not a female, there are a few things that I can do, not because I'm a guy, but because I've learned how to do it. Because, of course, I don't want to take anything away from women. They're wonderful. And I have so much respect for stunt women having been literally in their shoes. <laughs> You're one of the few people that can say that literally. Yeah. I've literally been in their shoes. And there was a panel a few years ago at Combat Con on stunt women. And I walked into that panel and everything they were talking about, I could relate. Because we don't think about it, but the world is so man-oriented and not female-oriented that when we see a guy falling down a set of stairs, he's fully dressed and he's wearing long sleeves and long pants and he can pad up as much as he wants. We see a woman falling down the very same set of stairs and she's wearing a short dress with no sleeves. Yeah. So there's absolutely no way she can pad up to do the same fall that a guy would do. It's a really interesting point. I've noticed that in a lot of movies, like I'm sure a lot of people have, is the men are always dressed and the women are practically undressed so much of the time. Yeah. How do you do stunt work like that? Because their technique is a lot cleaner. I was stunt doubling for, an, for the lead actress of a TV show a few years ago and she was riding a horse and the horse, she loses control of the horse and falls off the horse. And my stunt coordinator walks up to me and tells me, so Rob, can you pad up underneath that clothes? Dude, I'm wearing female clothes and fortunately she wasn't wearing a dress or a skirt at that moment. No, she was wearing pants because she was horseback riding but dude i can barely fit in this clothes i can barely move without ripping the clothes and you want me to put pads i have nowhere to put these okay well then just be safe of course so now i don't have to rely on pads to keep me safe i don't have to rely on where i'm wearing a back protector or a shoulder pads or knee pads. Now I have to rely on my technique. And if I didn't learn how to do that horseback fall properly, I'm going to get injured. And that's, I believe, I can't really tell because I've never been in the mindset of stunt women, but having stunt double for women, I would like to believe that they do have to rely a lot more on their technique because they can't rely on pads to keep them safe. So that's very interesting. I love stunt. There was a moment where I had stunt doubled for more women than men. That has shifted in the past recent years, but I still love stunt doubling for women more than I like stunt doubling for men because it's more challenging and because you really have to be on top of your game and you have to really be precise on your technique and not on your pads. That's, so. that's an amazing uh, answer, and it's so true. And tying it back to what we both do in sword fighting, it's like fencing in armor versus fencing unarmored. Yeah. I can't rely on my kit to protect me. It's my skill, my training, and my agility that protects exactly. me. Exactly. Yeah. So I've learned how to rely on technique and not on, on my gear. And that's helped me both doing stunt work, both for women and men, 
but you know, specifically for for women because as a guy I can pad up as much as I want, and sometimes I want to pad up more because that makes me look bigger. But as a, as a stunt woman, if I can use that term, I need to look lighter so and smaller so I can't pad up. But I do have to rely on my technique, both stunt doubling for women, which, like I said, I prefer stunt doubling for women because it's more challenging and because it showcases my technique better and it keeps me on my toes and not makes me forget my training and in HEMA. So. Yeah, that's very cool. And I love the, I love the way it, it, that training and that, that reliance upon technique changes your thought process. I did the, uh, the Patty Crane workshop and because it had such a rich historical background, I started focusing more and more on the historical aspect of fencing. I always figured that as a stunt guy, if I could incorporate a little bit more historical accuracy into my fights, it would be better. So I've been going back to the Patty Crane. I went to Ismac in 2000, uh, 2007. And that's where it all basically took off until a point where I kind of saw, okay, stage fighting is completely different from the historical aspect. And I kind of took the route of, okay, I'll still be doing stunts and I'll still be doing stage fighting and stage fencing, but I'll also get a little bit more involved with the historical aspect of sword fighting, the Western martial arts, historical martial arts, and I started going more and more into HEMA and WMA events and started participating in tournaments until today. So for those that aren't associated with the term, what does HEMA stand for? HEMA is the contraction for historical European martial arts. WMA, which I kind of still like using, is Western martial arts to differentiate between the Oriental, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, and what we were doing in Europe and America. And me personally, because I don't just do Western martial arts, but I've also gotten involved in developing my own system of the Aztec sword, the Mabawi. I've actually changed all those letters and I just go by HMA. Okay, historic martial arts. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I've always been a big fan of Western martial arts because that incorporates Europe and the Americas. Sure. For me, it, I've always thought, well, who decided which is East and which is West? Because if I stand in Japan and I look East, I'm looking into America. Yeah. So. Now, what, how did you get involved in stunt work? Did you start out as an actor or did you go straight into stunt work? Um, that is a very interesting story. I got into stunt work because I'm crazy and a little bit stupid. And I've always done crazy and very stupid things. Um, my dad uh, was a horseback rider when he was 18. And since me and my sister were born, in fact, before we were born, he had a motorcycle. So all our life, we were always outside doing some kind of adventurous stuff. My dad taught us how to scuba dive. My grandfather taught me how to rappel. So everything about my life kind of involved some risky, stupid stunt. So I, I started college and I majored in communication science. But everything about my major, we had to do, uh, I don't know, we had to talk about, uh, or we were doing a short film. And in that short film, I was putting some chases or some fights or whatever. So by the time I had to graduate, it was like, okay, no, I'm not set out for this. I don't want to be in front of the camera. So why don't I go and train to do what I like doing 
and get paid to do what I like doing. So get paid to scuba dive, get paid to horseback ride, get paid to rappel, get paid to drive. And I started looking online and I came up, I found out the stunt school up in Seattle with Dave Boucher and signed up. And right after college, all my friends were thinking about our graduation party. And I was on the first flight to Seattle to <laughs> train. Came back, started looking for some stunt coordinators and started working. It was a long process for me because had I known how things worked, I probably wouldn't have trained with Dave, although I don't regret it. It's been one of the best experiences I've ever had. And it, everything I learned uh, from Dave Boucher has been the basis for everything I do as a stunt performer right now. He taught me how to fall down stairs, how to do footfalls, how to do fist fights, how to do high falls. Uh, he set me in fire. We did some uh, precision driving. So although I did not come out of the school as a fully trained stunt professional, it did give me the basis for building upon that. Unfortunately, the stunt work in Mexico they don't take me training abroad very nicely. Mm. They prefer that I would have trained with some local stunt coordinator. So it's been a very tough road for me getting into stunt work now. Uh, but a few years ago, I really landed in one of the best stunt crews here in Mexico City. It's Four Element Stunts. That's my stunt crew right now. And they've been wonderful. They've embraced me. They actually enjoy the fact that I was trained abroad and that I can bring some of that training to the newer guys while I'm still learning from my stunt coordinator, who, I mean, he's been in the stunt business for over 20 years. His uncle is a stuntman. His brother is a stuntman. So it runs in his family. And I keep learning from him. And he's helped me to open up some doors to some other stunt crews. But yeah, right now I'm fortunate to be able to work with four element stunts. Nice. And so you're from Mexico, you trained in Seattle in the US. You've done work in Mexico. Where else have you worked? <clears throat> um, most of my work has been in Mexico. I would love to work in the US. Sadly, uh, work visas are not that common, especially for stunt people, because all my skills, there's a bunch of people who can do them. Yeah. But I did get a chance to shoot an episode of a Mexican TV show in LA last year. Okay, cool. I mean, it was a Mexican show. They were filming in LA, so they brought me in to, to shoot there. I've also done some work in Costa Rica. I was shooting a TV commercial for a Norwegian bank. Uh, and I was able to work in helping to set up a pirate stunt show in the Dominican Republic. That must have been fun. It was a lot of fun. Unfortunately, they had a few problems with getting the, you know, the ship ready and getting the weapons ready. So by the time my contract to help setting up the, I mean, I wasn't there as a stunt coordinator, but the idea was to bring in some experienced stunt people from abroad, set up the show, teach the show to the local crowd, and then have local actors take over, of, take over our roles while we were shipped out. So I helped to set up the choreographies. I was working under a stunt, co uh, stunt coordinator there. But yeah, it was a lot of fun. I'm so bummed that I never actually got to get on the ship and perform. But yeah. it was still a lot of fun. And you've also done a medieval show. Can you yes. tell us a little bit about that? Yes. Um, the, uh, there's a very strong... Uh, the Renaissance crowd here in Mexico. It started about 2005. My mom's cousin 
he worked for medieval times for many, many years in several different castles. He became one of the falconers and he trained the horses and he was one of the knights. So when the first rent fair opened up in Mexico, I emailed my mom's cousin, told him, okay, you know what, this is going on here in Mexico. I think you should check it out. So he got in contact with the people organizing the event. He volunteered as an advisor and they flew him in. He brought me along. And when we got there, there were no people trained to do the jousts. So, but they were still doing it, even though uh, they were trained for it. Well, they didn't have anybody not only trained, but anybody to do the jousts. Okay. So it was basically my mom's cousin and his partner back then and me. And he, he just looked at me. So can you ride? I'm not the best rider, but yeah, I can stay on my horse or I can fall off the horse on cue. Okay, so you're getting on the horse, you're knighting, you're doing the medieval games, and then you're jousting. Okay, that sounds amazing. What <laughs> games? You don't know which games? No, I've never done th this kind of show before. Okay, so you're spearing the rings and you're throwing the javelin and you're hitting the, the shield. The, the quintain. The quintain. So just follow our lead. Okay, fine. It worked and they had success. They loved it. So they, they set up a bigger show and we started touring through different uh, venues, especially state, uh, state fairs here in Mexico. So I got to tour all over Mexico with, with the show. They started bringing in some more experienced knights for the show. So I, I didn't continue knighting in the show. So I wasn't really jousting or uh, sword fighting anymore. But I got to do the King of Arms. And then we, we had a very interesting ending in one of the shows where the Black Knight would you know, ride back into the arena after he, was, he had been kicked out. And he would get up on the castle and take the crown off the king and throw the king off the, off the castle. And when we did that show, I got to be king because they needed some stupid stunt guy to take, a, I don't know, a 12 foot fall. So. And if I remember correctly, that fall was onto minimal padding. There was no padding. I was wearing uh, a back protector, a motorcycle back protector, and I was doing a flip fall onto about three feet of sand. Oh. Because since we were on the road and we didn't have the gear, we had those mounts of sand to decorate the, uh, the arena. So we would just loosen the sand and there was absolutely no way we could get some hay or airbags in there, not even cardboard boxes because they wouldn't have looked time correct. Yeah. So yeah, I was falling onto sand. <laughs> the original idea was to do a footfall and just land on the sand. I mean, it wasn't that high of a fall and move out of the way and the black, because the Black Knight would jump right behind me. But the first time we did it in rehearsal, I sunk into the sand about <laughs> knee, knee deep. And I still had to get out of the way for the Black Knight to jump behind me. So when we did that first show with the fall, I didn't tell anybody, I didn't ask for permission. And when the Black Knight pushes me, he basically just touches my back and says, okay, go. I went into a flip fall and landed on my back. He then jumped behind me and he got stuck knee deep in, in the sand, had to crawl his way out of the sand. Then they would throw me all over the arena and they had an executioner come in and whip me while they tied me and then dragged me to the dungeon. And after the show, the Black Knight, who was actually my mom's cousin's partner, comes up to me and says, did I push you too hard? No, you barely touched me. Then why did you take that awful fall and you didn't land on your feet? Well, this is actually safer because I'm not sinking in, into the sand. 
well, I don't want you doing that. It's dangerous. It's actually safer. I, I'm trained to do this. I know how to do this. And I've got back protector to, to protect myself. Well, I don't want you doing this. Well, yeah, but this is a lot safer than what you want me to do. Uh, per, uh, small parenthesis, he did that fall about two, three times, and then he would just walk down the stairs and meet me in, in the arena because <laughs> his knees couldn't take it while I was doing that flip fall yeah. two, or three, uh, two or three times a week. They actually had me sign a waiver that I would not sue the show if something happened. So, And this is what the training with Dave Boucher helped exactly. you do. Yeah. yeah, that's exactly it. Oh, fantastic. Now, I want to go back to HEMA just a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. What, when you started HEMA, what were you studying and what do you, how has that morphed into what you're studying now? Oh, gosh. Uh, what, what was I studying back then? Basically, I was studying what you were teaching because you were one of my first instructors back in 2006. So back in the day, I was studying Pior and I was studying a little bit of Fabrice and Capoferro. And yeah, that was basically what was being taught back in the day. I know you don't really like me going into this, but a few years later, I met Scott Brown. And for some strange reason, I know Italian or Latin is closer related to Spanish than German is, but my brain doesn't work as most people's brains do. So the whole names of the guards in Italian was starting to get a little too confusing for me, while as the names in German were a bit more clear. Cool. And because I was just starting Mayer's Art of Combat book, has a lot more detail on how to do the, uh, the moves and how to the sword fight than what Fior does. And without having somebody to rely on, I kind of started morphing it into German sword fighting just because it became easier for me and it was more accessible for me. And throughout my HEMA career, I've been able to work closer with you We've had some wonderful classes co-taught. I've continued to take many of your classes. One of my favorite classes I've ever taken with you has been Swetnam. I, I just love the rapier fighting with Swetnam. And so, yeah, I've been able to work closer with you. I've been able to work with people like Brad Waller, John Lennox, Brian Stokes, who are very detail-oriented people. So they've actually taught me how to look into the details in, in the treatises. And yeah. that has actually opened my eyes. I mean, back in the day, I studied Fabrice, and I couldn't make heads or tails out of Fabrice. And back in 2007 at ISMAC, or ISMAC as you like to call it, I bought my first copy of Talhofer's book. And I couldn't make heads or tails of what Talhofer was doing because the, the text is minimal and the, the illustrations are very precise if you know how to interpret them. So by working with people like yourself, like Brad, John, Brian, who are very detail-oriented, I've now been able to re-pick up on Fabrice who's got very strange footwork, or Talhofer, who also has some very wonky footwork, and start making sense of it. So now my fencing has morphed more into, if it's longsword, it's basically Talhofer and Mayer, and I'll sprinkle in a little bit of Fior when I want to drive my opponents crazy. <laughs> and if it's rapier, I'll transition between Destreza, which I was really fortunate to learn from the Maestros Martinez, Ray and Jeanette. And I'll morph then into Swetnam and Mayer and Giganti, Fabrice, uh, Swetnam. So, yeah, I, 
mix and match a lot depending on what my opponent is offering. I once uh, helped organize a tournament in a rapier tournament. Nowadays in the HEMA world, it's almost all longsword. Yeah. But when this all started, there was almost no longsword and it was all rapier. Yeah. yeah. Very I little remember, longsword. I remember Ismac, the, the tournament was rapier. There was no longsword tournament. And I once helped organize a tournament where when the combatants signed up, so if you and I signed up on this tournament, we had to list the styles that we were going to fence in. And we were not allowed to break out of that style. Okay. So you could do two or three different styles. So you could go Sweatnam, Fabris, Gigante. But if you did Capafero or more like modern fencing, you got docked points. Nice. You had to stay in what you said you were going to, st the style you said you were going to fence in. And this was all about showing not only can you fence, but you can fence in a specific way. That was a lot of fun to do. Oh, I bet. Because sadly, I mean, I, not everybody, but more and more we start seeing uh, tournament fighters who, yes, they are fast, they are strong, they are martially sound, but you hardly see any of what the old masters were writing about in their texts. So personally, every time I transition from one style to the next, I love hearing people outside of the ring in the audience actually commenting, okay, yeah, now he's doing this technique. Now he's doing this technique. Now he's doing that technique. Back when, when I was doing the, the Renaissance shows, I set up one with my own crew, not the one my mom's cousin was working with, but this was my very own. And the last fight I did with my fencing partner, it was Case of Swords versus Sword and Buckler. I was actually doing Sword and Buckler. And as soon as I struck the 133 post, I heard someone in the audience yelling out, he's doing 133. Okay, I'm done. People can recognize that I'm doing the technique properly. I can die happy now. Nice, nice. Now, you'd mentioned, I'm going to start that again. You had mentioned that you studied with me, and I've also had the opportunity to study with you, and you've began a study, as you mentioned a little earlier, of the Aztec weapons. How did you decide to start doing that? And since there's no written documentation that I know of, and maybe you can enlighten me on this, how do you redevelop what they were doing? Okay, so back uh, again, everything sword wise or sword related goes back to the paddy crane. So I was at the paddy crane one of the years past and Brad Waller approached me and in his very calm Brad Waller voice told me, hey buddy, you're Mexican and Mexicans have a strong tradition of warriors. The Aztecs, there's nobody researching Aztec warfare. I think you should go back home and research on that and then come back and teach it to us. Back then, I was just a mere student. I never thought that I would be teaching anybody. So to have someone like Brad tell me to come back home, research, and then go back and teach, that was amazing for me. It meant that somebody actually believed in what I was doing and what I could accomplish. That's really powerful. Yeah, yeah. So... I came back and I started doing my homework and I started going to the museums and looking at the, uh, at the codex and trying to talk to the people from the, from the museums to see if they could set me on the path. And there, like you said, there are no written records. The Spaniards destroyed everything because they didn't want the Aztecs revolting. 
So I've been able to look into the codex and that was basically it. So every time I teach this class, I always have to give out the disclaimer that this is not historically based. This is my interpretation and this is my system. Your interpretation of what? Of what I've seen in the codexes and what I've been able to cross train. Like I, like I mentioned earlier, I've been able to work with you. I've been able to work with John Lennox, especially his boarding actions classes and the way he uses the tomahawk. And then I actually had a Makwawit made with the obsidian blades and I started doing some test cutting. And that kind of changed the way I would hold the weapon. So it was basically cross training with several different weapons, trying to find how it was similar to the, uh, to the Aztec weapon and how they were different. And with those similar, uh, similarities, try to work and build on those. And the differences kind of disregard them. And okay, so I think I can use the, the top end of the Makwawi like John Lennox's um, axe punch to the, uh, to the shoulder blade. Okay, that works. So, okay, I've been doing some of the test cutting on tatami. Well, if I'm cutting the, the tatami as if it's a sword, I'm not getting anything done. Okay, let's try pushing or pulling that cut as if it were a saw. Oh, well, what do you know? It actually cuts. So it's been a lot of testing and going back to the drawing board and testing again and going back to the drawing board. So I don't claim to, this to be historically accurate. I've had many martial artists, historical European martial artists, come up to me and say, well, yeah, what you're teaching from a martial point of view does make sense. So I'll keep doing it but it's my interpretation and it's entirely my system. You've mentioned a word a couple times, the Mawa wheel. Yeah. Can you tell us what that is? Absolutely. The Makwa wheel is... Oh, Makwa Can you say that one more time? Ma Kwa wheel Ma Kwa wheel Yes. So it's basically a long wooden paddle. Imagine a cricket bat lined with very sharp obsidian blades. It's lost a few because I've actually done some test cutting with it and I haven't had it re reassembled. But yeah, so it's basically a very, um, a very long or not entirely that long uh, wooden paddle lined with very, very sharp obsidian blades. What? Would they would they use that by itself? Because it looks like it's a two-handled tool. It, it looks like a two-handed weapon, but what I found is that the long shaft actually works as a counterbalance. On the sword, we, can, you know, we have the pommel, which counterbalances the blade. By not having any steel or metal, they needed a longer shaft to counterbalance the weapon. It's still heavy. I've had some people who mentioned that the Makwawit, some uh, historians mentioned that the Makwawit should not be that heavy, but I've tried a few lighter ones and they just don't feel right. They don't swing properly. And what I found is that depending on the way you hold it, it, can, it will never be light, but it becomes lighter. If you're not holding it diagonal, you're not uh, holding all the weight. If you hold it more vertical, then the weight is better balanced. And being a uh, heavier weapon, it becomes sturdier when you have to parry or block a strike. And it also gives it momentum to, uh, to make even stronger strikes. So this is a one-handed weapon because on the left hand, you would have the chimali or the shield, so. Okay, so this is uh, weapon and shield. Yes, it's a weapon and shield system. And then looking at the width of that, if you're holding that upright, it's almost like you have a shield with cutting edges. Oh, of course, yeah. Uh, I've discovered that it's a lot easier 
if you block or parry with the flat of the weapon. And that also aligns the, uh, the edges for a nice cut. This is not a dueling weapon. So it's not like I'm gonna take a rapier or a small sword and just stand in guard and fight one-on-one. -on -one. This is a melee weapon. I'm fighting 3,000 of my guys against two or 5,000 of your guys. So if I'm standing there and I'm dueling with this weapon, that's a sure way to get killed by some other person. So I wanna go in fast, bloody, not necessarily deadly because the purpose of, of warfare in, in the Aztec times was to capture prisoners, bring them back to Tenochtitlan and sacrifice them to the gods and have the heart given out to which the postly. So if I'll get where? Tenochtitlan, uh, the Aztec capital, what is now Mexico City. Okay. So if I kill my opponent, then that just means I'm a very lousy warrior. So because you don't have sacrifices to bring the sun up exactly, in the morning. Exactly. So when I teach this system. All of my targets are either the side of the torso, but they're mostly arms and legs. If you can't walk, you can't chase me, and then some other you know, people behind me will come back, uh, will come around and tie you up, and you'll just have to hobble back to my city. If I cut your arm, then you can't hold your weapon and you can't fight. So it's uh, I I found that aiming for arms and legs is a much easier, better target, and more historically accurate because now I can bring captives back. And depending on the number of live captives I was able to bring back, that would just give me higher ranks. If I brought in five captives, five live captives, I would move higher up on on the warrior scale until I finally reached either the Jaguar or the Eagle warrior status. So those were the pinnacle of the status, the warrior status was Jaguar or Eagle? Yes, they were both, um, both uh, similar in, in status. They were just different classes, but the, uh, those were the elite of the elite. And of course, as you move higher up on the ranks, your armor becomes better. When you start, you're wearing a loincloth, and as you keep moving up, you're, mo you're wearing now a long cotton shirt that covers your arms, or first it's just a shirt, the sleeveless shirt, then it's, uh, it covers your arms and comes down to the knees. So, and of course, it comes, uh, this is very interesting, it covers your arms and it comes down to the knees because those are the, um, the targets that I'm going for, with the weapon. Yeah. Yeah, and so it, I was talking to somebody just the other day about the concept of a arms race is not new. Yeah. You develop a weapon, so I develop a defense against it. Then you develop a weapon to defeat the defense I created and so on and so forth. And so what you're saying with the Aztec warriors is that arms race to move up, it was there, but you had to earn it. Exactly, yeah, yeah. As you were moving up on the ranks, you got better weapon, uh, better protection and better weapons. I'm sure you got to eat better too. Of course, yeah. And uh, my mom hates this. She just recently found out that I have been shooting this little piece of trivia all over the place and she's like, Wait, why are you telling people abroad this? This is not nice. Well, yeah, the Aztecs were not nice. They were not known to be nice people. But it has been documented that once they took the heart out, the rest of the body was divided amongst the people who helped capture that prisoner. And those pieces of the body, once they were divided, they were cooked into a broth which we still eat, we don't eat it with human, uh, 
meat anymore. Now we eat it with either pork or chicken. But pozole, which is a very traditional meal, comes from eating the human flesh with maize, corn, and some vegetables as a broth to not throw the rest of the warrior to waste. So Right. And if I remember correctly, it was also a sign of respect to the fallen warrior. Of course. I mean, the Aztecs are not the first nor the last culture that ate human flesh and amongst many cultures eating your your enemy meant that you could gain the powers from your enemy you not only study martial arts and teach martial arts and are researching and recreating a lost art which i find fascinating and um, i've learned a lot from you playing and using these different weapons because I came into the mindset of it's a sword. Yeah. <laughs> and it must have been just a complete, uh, uh, it, it must have been very strange for the Aztec warriors to come against the conquistadors who were, the conquistadors were about killing, but the Aztecs were about capturing to kill later. Yes. And so when they were fighting to defend their homeland, it must have been very strange, almost to to fight against these these foreigners that all they want to do is kill don't they understand what's going to happen exactly i i mean for me it it seems mind-boggling the culture clash amongst the spaniards and the aztecs okay so why are you trying to kill me stop i need to bring you as a as a captive or bring me as a prisoner I don't mind, I'll, I'll die later, but bring me in as a captive. On the other hand, it also might, it might have been very mind-boggling for the conquistadors who were wearing breastplates to protect themselves and the Aztecs were not aiming for those little parts. So when I'm, uh, when I'm teaching my Aztec weaponry class, I always tell people that the conquistadors were the inventors of canned food because <laughs> they were protecting what we were going to feed the, the sun god. So there yeah. you go. <laughs> yeah. And uh, boy, were they surprised. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Wait, I'm protecting my heart. Why aren't you attacking that? Because I don't need that right now. <laughs> That's not for me. That's for the gods. Yeah. <laughs> You also run an event, a HEMA event. Can yes. you tell us what is it called and what is it? Because it's got, you do some neat things with it. Can you tell us about it? Yes. Um, fortunately, the event was, uh, was set up while I was working at, in the Dominican Republic. So I didn't have a very strong internet connection or very uh, available internet con connection. So my fencing partner took care of some of the logistical aspects of it. And that's why it ended up with a German name. I would have loved to have it a more pre-Hispanic name. So it's a Schwerkampf, which sadly just translates as sword fighting. And it's an event that we've been running for seven years now. And we try to well, we don't try. We actually manage to, all the proceeds, we donate to different causes. The first time, one of our HEMA brothers had you know, fallen in coma after a very bad uh, disease, and they needed money to help pay for the bills. So we donated you know, part of that money to that. Um, we've also donated money to rural uh, rural you know, towns to help build we didn't exactly what we gathered didn't build the in the school but hey whatever we can it donate helps. helps we've also donated about two or three years now to an institution that helps children with cancer so all of our proceeds go to 
uh, deserve benefits. That's very cool that you're able to take sword fighting and these martial arts and use them to find a way to help support all these great causes. And seven years, that's a long time. Yeah, yeah, well, I think that sword fighting has given me so much. It's opened the world to me and it's given me friends all over the world that I never would have met had it not been for sword fighting. So sword fighting has given me personally so much. Why am I not going to take sword fighting and give back to other people? So if I can, if I can help uh, pay for a school in the middle of nowhere, Mexico, or I can help kids with cancer, or I can help a fallen Hema brother who's not who doesn't have the finances to help pay for his, for his medical bill, which was astronomical. Then why why won't I use the connections that Hema has given me and bring in some of the top notch Hema instructors and fighters from the world and help someone else out? So. That's amazing. That's a really nice way to do it. And it's so important that we stick together. And uh, the concept of the, the sword fighter, the knight, is to be there to help those that are less fortunate than they. Of course. And that's, that's what we do. Yeah. How have you found that your study in martial arts has affected and helped or not your stunt work. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that I've been dealing with that for the past year. I've been uh, training with uh, with a local stunt coordinator for an upcoming uh, show that it should start uh, shooting again after COVID. It should start uh, filming uh, filming again next year, early next year. But there's a lot of sword fighting in, in this show. And of course, I keep, uh, I keep being told that, no, 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 you have to parry here and you have to parry here. And it's always these, oh shit moment where you, if you didn't parry at that last second, you'd have been struck. And I can't help thinking, well, what if my character actually knows how to sword fight? Wouldn't He's he be soldier, able to parry properly and not wait for that l very last possible second? But then I have to remember that this is going to be a TV show and that the audience, they don't know sword fighting. Yeah. I mean, not everybody is you watching a TV show. So they don't know the sword fighting and they want to see that dramatic moment where, oh my God, if he didn't parry he would have been killed. So it's been, it's been a learning curve, a two-way learning curve, because as I mentioned, I started with the Patty Crane, which was basically stage fighting. So I was used to these big motions and having the audience see the, uh, the whole move of the sword so that both the audience and my partner could see what was happening. And then I started in tournament fighting and I had to bring everything closer when it came to attacking and everything further out when it came to pairing so that I could stop my opponent's sword momentum before it actually gained strength and could break through my guard. So my, guard, uh, my defenses became wider, my attacks became shorter, and so that was uh, my first learning curve, teaching myself how to do all these really wide actions and making them smaller. And now I'm, I have to relearn how to make those small actions bigger. <laughs> and it's been mind frying every single training session because, okay, you're not trying to kill someone. You're trying to keep your partner safe. And every time my stunt coordinator comes up and says, Oh, but that's not a strong enough strike. And I'm standing there. Well, I know if I do this biomechanically correct, they're going to feel it for a couple of days. I don't need to strike with 
all this big motion force to make it strong. I, I can pull a very short motion and make it strong enough if my body mechanics are correct. Oh, yes, but you want the camera to be able to see that big sweeping yeah. action. So, yeah. So it's been interesting trying to learn what I had unlearned and unlearn what I still learned without forgetting how to sword fight. So, yeah. It's I can a hoot. see how that would be challenging. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hoot. <laughs> <laughs> and this show that you're working on, you were telling me the other day that you've been doing a lot of horse riding. Yeah. In preparation. What kind of, can you tell us anything about it? Um, I'm not, I haven't signed any waiver or any confidentiality uh, papers, so I guess I can talk about it. Well, keep it generalized. It's basically a show on the, the conquest of Mexico. Okay. It's gonna be it's gonna be Cortez coming into Mexico and con uh, conquering Mexico. And what so kind of character are you? Uh, sadly, I wanted to be an Aztec because of the of the weapon, since I've been working on it for so long. On the other hand, I'm glad I'm not gonna be an Aztec. I'm gonna be a Spaniard, and that helps because what we're working with. Uh, Aztec weaponry wise it has absolutely nothing to do with the system I have developed so uh -huh. it's going to be less frustrating if I'm just swinging a sword than if I'm swinging a uh, Makwawit so but yeah it's basically a show it's going to be a show on the conquest of Mexico so what I've been doing horseback riding so far it's just getting my saddle so it's basically just working around in circles and going back to the circles again. And then we're working on, okay, we're riding with the horses and we've got the Aztecs running and we just strike them from behind with, with a sword. And, or then we're, we're sitting on the horses and we're striking two or three times on a foot soldier and then riding off. So, so far that's what we've been working. It, <laughs> It's just trying to get our saddle, and it's not actual rehearsal for the show because we still don't know what we will have to do. Right. Just so it's general just kind of, ideas of things. Yeah. Uh, it's basically, well, we, they had the horses, they had the swords, the Aztecs were on foot, so I guess at some point some Spaniard's going to ride behind this, an Aztec and strike him with a sword, so we might as well learn how to do it. So Yeah. Yeah, it's, a, it's one of the things that I've always really uh, has driven me to want to get into film work and that kind of thing is I want to play with other people's toys. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we've done some combined classes and I'd like you to tell everybody watching this about the class that we've been able to do together. Oh, it's uh, it's still one of my fav uh, favorite classes, and right now it's uh, really frustrating because it's exactly what the show is going to be about. It's Spaniards versus Aztecs. Of course, our class has been Spaniards versus Aztecs from a martial point of view, how you know, Spaniards would have fought with the weapons that they would have had at the time versus what the Aztecs had and how either side would have had to deal with the opposing side. And the, you know, the title we came up for this class has always been one of my favorite uh, titles, Montezuma's Revenge versus Chicken Pox. <laughs> so yeah, it's one of my favorite classes to teach, not only because of what I'm teaching, but because I get to teach with someone I admire, like yourself. But at the same time, right now, it's really frustrating because that's exactly what I'm working on for this show from a show perspective and not from the martial side of right. things. So, I, This has been great. I, I've really enjoyed talking with you and hearing about the things that you've done. Uh, but I have one last question before we close this up. And if you were 
well, two questions. I'll start with this one. If you were to meet yourself when you were first starting this, what advice would you give yourself? When I was starting chemo or when I was starting stunts? Both. Okay. When I was, if I could meet myself when I was starting stunts, I would tell myself to keep my mouth shut and don't tell stunt coordinators that I had trained abroad. And that would have opened a lot more doors for myself instead of having to knock on doors and have them shot in my face because you, you were the rich kid who trained abroad, so you probably don't need this. So I would have told myself to keep my mouth shut and just come in as if you had known nothing. Still go out and train with the stunt school with Dave Boucher. Just don't tell anybody that you trained and that would make your training a lot easier. If I could tell my, uh, my younger uh, Hema self, I would have uh, given the exact opposite advice and I would have told myself to be more, more vocal because it took me many years to, uh, to actually start teaching, not because I didn't think I was ready enough. I mean, at, certain point, at a certain level, Yes, I did think I was too inexperienced and I knew way more capable people teaching. But then I also saw people who had less time practicing chemo, I don't know, two, three years having practiced chemo who were already teaching because they would come up to events and speak up and say, I've been working on this, can I teach? And I always had thought that I had to earn that right. So I would keep my mouth shut and not say anything. Yes, I've been working on this. Can I teach it? Until somebody came up to me and said, oh, so you've been working on this. Why don't you come and teach? So I, my, my younger stunt self, I would have told him to keep his mouth shut. My younger Hema self, I would have told him to speak up and to nice. say, I know I'm still not the best instructor. I've been fortunate enough that I've been asked to teach in Mexico, the US, Canada, and Europe. And I still feel I have so much more to learn as an instructor and as a HEMA practitioner. And this whole COVID-19 situation is really destroying a lot of concepts I had because I thought I was a an accomplished instructor, not the best, but a good and accomplished instructor. And now that everything has shifted into a more virtual world and now we're doing classes online, I'm absolutely lost. I'm a fish out of water because I don't know how to teach online. Yeah. I'm very, because of the people I've trained with, I'm very detail oriented and I need to be able to get right in there and move your feet. They're pointing 20 degrees left. I need them to point 35 degrees right. And I need to be able to move your foot physically. And I need to be able to see that. And I can't see that on a screen when I'm teaching online. And I don't think I have the moral authority to just put on a video and say, oh yes, this is how such and such cut or how posta di donna is supposed to be done. Well, yeah, who am I to say that? So I can't really put out teaching videos on YouTube on, yes, this is my interpretation because I don't think I've earned that right to say, yes, what I'm teaching is correct. But at the same time, I know that when I'm teaching personally, that what I've done and what I've learned can help someone become better. So this whole virtual teaching is really destroying my brain and I need to relearn how to teach through a computer. Uh, my last question for you, Roberto, is I like to ask this of people that I've known for a while. If What is a memory that you have of something that we've done or we've been involved in together? What's something that sticks out in your head? <sighs> There's so many. 
but probably my three my, uh, my three favorite memories you know, with you I have to there's a three favorite memories with you and one with Susan. And I'll tell that one because the, I know you're, you'll enjoy that one. My memory with Susan, which also involves you, was first Combat Con, the launcher tournament. I felt really sloppy. I felt slow. And I'm stepping out of the room for a drink of water. And this wonderful lady comes up to me and says, oh, your, fight, your fighting is wonderful and you're fighting so fast i just enjoy watching you fight and i'm thinking because the tournament was open to the audience i'm thinking well this is nice thank you very kind but you probably don't understand what we're doing and then i found out she's your wife <laughs> okay so she probably does know a little bit of what she's talking about probably a little bit more than i do so that has been my fondest memory of Susan, and both her and you have been some of my strongest supporters in tournament fighting, and I love you guys for that. My three favorite mo uh, memories with you, one would be the, the Makawi fighting in Mexico with you. That was fun. Where you were actually, as a trained uh, Spaniard in that uh, moment, going for the kill. And I was... Uh, it was this shocking moment we were talking about earlier, about, but you're not supposed to kill me. You're a bad warrior. You're a bad Aztec. Well, yeah, yeah I never claimed to be an Aztec. So I tell that story a lot, too. Yeah, that's one of my favorite memories. The other was that first combat con, the fundraising uh, uh, fighting for, uh, through 24 hours, doing some quarter staff fighting with you, and how suddenly you went for that quarterstaff in between my legs so you could pull out and I just had to back up because I knew what you were doing <laughs> and that look on your face why did you move out of that sir because I've trained with you I know where you're going <laughs> I mean I'm no fool <laughs> and my last one was that same time you were in Mexico when we did the Macquarie fight we actually faced each other in the Longster tournament and because I had trained with you on half sorting, I went into half sword. That's right. And you met me in half sword, and we had a couple of very wonderful passes in half sword, which I know if I move into half sword at any other tournament, my opponent will not be kind enough to move into half sword. So being able to transition from the long grip on the on the long sword into half sorting and be able to have a couple of passes with someone i respect and with the person who actually taught me that that's one of my favorite memories because i know that will never happen at any other tournament in my life that was a lot of fun i remember that roberto this has been great i thank you so much for spending time with me and with everybody watching this and for sharing your experiences with us and to reiterate to you and to everybody else watching this, speak up. You know more than somebody else. And if you don't speak up and share your knowledge, those other people will never get the benefit of hearing what you have to say. I will. I just need to learn how to speak up through a computer and share what I've learned from people like yourself with people who are not as fortunate as I am to meet you in person. So if I can take what little you've been able to share with me and share it with other people and bring them closer to what the giants I'm standing on, like you, like Brad, like Brian, Doc, the Martinez, all those people who have forged me, Scott Brown, who have made me the, the HEMA personality that I am, if I can, bring other people closer to you through sharing what you have taught me. I definitely need to speak up. Thank you, Digger. It, this has been an honor. I'm both honored and humbled that you chose to interview me because call it imposter syndrome or whatever, I never thought that I was worthy of 
this interview. Yeah. So thank think, you so much. Like I said, you and Susan are two of my strongest supporters, and I am truly honored to have you guys backing me up. So thank you very much. Stay safe. Stay safe. Ish, because I know uh, you. that's 43 years too late. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll see you on the other side of this. Absolutely. Yes. Looking forward to when we can meet in person. Yes, sir. Take care. Thanks for being here. You too. Thank you for uh, so much. Thanks a lot, Roberto. That was fantastic. It's always a pleasure to hear from you and to talk to people with so much experience like you've got. If you enjoyed what you saw today, please hit the subscribe button and the notification button below. Subscribe to our channel and take a look at all the different videos that we have available. Thanks a lot.